And we're live. Excellent. Hello, my name is Zach, and I'm with the East Baton Rouge Parish Library. And here I'm welcoming you to another episode of There's a Game for Everyone with Little Wars. Uh, is, yeah, indeed. This is a virtual program organized by the library for International Games Week in lieu of other you know physical programming we we have this um we have these this little this series where we discuss video uh, discuss board games with van from little wars he, um he stopped by stopped by on tuesday to talk about games based on age ranges and here today he's to talk about he's here to talk about games based on number of players so if perhaps you've got say you know like you've got a you've got a gaming group already you've got a certain number of people and you need to find something that fits everybody fits that so that one person doesn't doesn't have to always sit off to the side mm -hmm. or, or you're not constantly bringing out a game with them with a suboptimal number of people so the game isn't as much fun anyway so van is here to tell us about all kinds of fun games how are you doing tonight yeah. van i'm doing great i'm uh, i'm always excited to talk about games uh <laughs> I was more excited about doing the, well, actually, so the two, the Tuesday session was great because uh, picking games by ages is not something that uh, happens very commonly. So it was, it was an interesting challenge, but picking games by number of players, that is a much more common question. So I feel more equipped to deal with it. So. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's right there on the boxes. <laughs> yep, we're good, we're good to go. So I think uh, I prepared a small PowerPoint that will look very similar to the PowerPoint that we did on Tuesday. Fantastic. And um, we're gonna go ahead and get that rolling. But our first uh, section is about a uh, one to two players, right? Um, so, do we do we have the PowerPoint ready? Is this is this something we got kind of going on here? Oh, there we go. go. Aha! Yeah. Ta -da. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. So our first <laughs> our, our first section is about uh, games for one to two players. So we actually get this question a lot because a lot of people you know who uh, just might be living in with their girlfriend or boyfriend or just their spouse or something. They're looking for a game that they can play uh, with just one other person, and so. And um, it's a very common question because most of the times when you think of board games, you think of like Monopoly or Risk or like a game that you would play with a lot of people. Um, but you would be surprised that there is actually a large number of games designed for just one or two people to play. Um, so on our next slide, we're going to look at <laughs> the very first feature game, Onitama. Okay, so this is one of my favorite two-player games um, because when I was growing up, I... Uh, was a part of the chess club with the library or um, and and other kind of gaming clubs in school. And so Onitama scratches that itch for me. It's a chess-like game, um, but it, on one hand, I think is easier to teach and understand. And then on, but on the other hand, just has the almost same level of complexity uh, on uh, as far as like the ceiling of, of learning goes. So uh, I actually have a demo box here. So I'm gonna actually change my camera so we can take a look. Uh, we can we can do a, um, let's see, visual look at the game. Yes, this is my my personal copy of Onitama. It's a it's well loved. <laughs> <laughs> it com it comes in a uh, kind of rectangular box here. And when you open it out, the first thing you're gonna see is you're gonna see a case with four pawns, okay? And then we have a stack of cards and it comes also comes with a board. So we're gonna take a look at this here. Yeah. Ooh, oh, that's a nice mat, wow. Yeah, it comes with this nice, uh, this nice uh, this mouse pad material <laughs> <laughs> mat. Yeah, yeah so, a copy I seen online looked like it had just like a, a cardstock one, but that's really nice. Cool. Yeah, I think that they've had a they've had older copies of the of the game before, so uh, this is this would be actually a, a newer copy. So, anyway, yeah. So with our with the mat uh, that we have here, you'll see that it's a simple five by five grid, and then um, there is a red center on one side and then a blue center on the opposite side. So, what happens is your pieces go uh, all on one side. So you put your grand masterpiece, which I'll show you here. So you have a, a grand masterpiece here. Yeah. And then you have, and then you would have four, uh, four pawn pieces that kind of would be next to them. They're shaped like monks, um, with the grand master type thing. 
Um, so you would put your five pieces on the sides here and then um, with your grandmaster in the center. And there's only two win conditions you have to worry about. Either you capture your opponent's grandmaster or another interesting win condition is if you get your grandmaster to stand on the opposite color space. So you make, you make it all the way to the opposite <laughs> side of the board. So those are the only conditions. Now, the interesting part about the game, the part that I love is the cards. So these, uh, there's a bunch of different cards for moves that are named after different animals. Like, you know, we have the ox right here. Um, we have like tiger um, and stuff like that. So we have all these different cards. And what is interesting about these cards is they actually dictate how your pieces move. And so that's why I said that this game is a little bit easier to teach, in my opinion, because you have instructional cards that tell you how your pieces move. Now, what's interesting about it is that you only have two cards per side. So at the start of the game, you would draw two cards at random, and then those would be your potential movement options. So if you had dragon and boar, these are the two choices you would be able to go through. Uh, and these movement options would govern the movement options for all of your pieces. So like if you wanted to move your grandmaster, you can use either of these moves or a pawn. They could also use either of these moves. Now, what creates our, our uh, high ceiling, our kind of strategic understanding of how we can win this game, uh, the, what happens is when you use a move, it actually cycles and moves to your opponent. So every move that you use, you lose access to, and you give it to your opponent to use. And then whenever they use a move, that, that move goes to you. Oh. So yeah, and, and so it, <laughs> it creates this crazy conundrum of like thinking super far ahead uh, because you have to try to decide, mm -hmm. you know, how um, you have to try to, you have to try to plan out like what, Oh, okay. What, you know, what, like, not only am I using a move, but I have to give up that move so that my opponent will be able to use it in the future. Yeah. Um, it's devilishly simple and <laughs> easy to, to understand and learn. And then once you learn, you can just jump right into it and start playing immediately. Uh, the games go very quickly, you know, like there, there are fewer stalemate situations like would potentially happen in a chess mm -hmm. game. There's fewer pieces also. There's only five pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I have sold tons and tons of copies of this game, <laughs> of this, yeah. of this game for, the, for that very reason. It's also <laughs> gorgeous. I think it might sell one more, at least for me. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's... I'm liking that. And I, li I love it. I feel like, because I mean, since it's completely, you know, it's just the card is just the movement. It's not words or anything. You can just get, I, I, you know, get my kids and start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's also a very aesthetically pleasing game. Like I, I know people who have it set up, uh, like I... I and one of my lawyer friends has a game just set up in his office. So similar to like if you had a chess set, you know, in your oh. office that it looks like really classy, right? Like he just oh, has gosh. this <laughs> game set up because it, uh, it looks really pretty. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that, that's a, that's only time for you. I wish that, I mean, yeah, we'll have to, you have to come by and we'll, we'll play it sometime, <laughs> but um, okay. So that would be our highlight game for our one to two. Our next one is going to be Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. All right. Ooh. Yeah. I know Sherlock Holmes is, has exploded lately. You know, yes, in he's, a, he's in a lot of media. Uh, <laughs> everywhere. Um, I am personally an avid Sherlock Holmes fan. I read all of the books whenever I was a kid. Also checked out from the library, you know. <laughs> uh, and... Um, yeah, so I, I'm already a big fan of Sherlock Holmes, so that 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 part wasn't necessary to, to sell me on this game. The the part that I really, really enjoy is that this game is, is a cooperative game. Um, I put it in the one to two player section, but realistically, you can play this game with any number of people because all you're doing is you're, you're solving a mystery. Uh, I find that it works best with, you know, one to two people because that way you don't kind of step on each other's toes. A bunch but um the general premise of the game is that you are working alongside sherlock holmes so and you are presented this mystery in the in the same avenue that he is and uh, at the end of it once you solve once you solve the mystery you compare the steps you took 
to the steps that Sherlock Holmes took and you try to be as close to Sherlock Holmesian as possible. So, um, uh, so on, on our next slide, we'll look at some of the components here, but like what this usually results in is uh, there's, there's a logic, there's a logic chain that you can follow to be the most efficient possible in solving the mystery. But the game gives you a bunch of different choices to look at. And so, you know, usually you don't solve it in quite the same amount of time as Sherlock Holmes because he's superhuman essentially. Uh, but Looking at some of the game pieces here, what I love about it is that uh, if you've ever done uh, any sort of like kind of puzzle game before, uh, a lot of them have similar elements, right? Like you have the uh, you you have clues, and you might even have like suspects that you talk to, and that kind of thing. Um, this game has all of that and more. It's so immersive and fun. So here on the right side, and this is just for the second version of the game. Um, the Jack the Ripper version in the West End Adventures. But there's actually three different copies of this game that are, that are out right now that all have different um, adventures in them. So in this one, we have, we have a picture, um, you know, the giant river in the middle is the Thames, right? And uh, when you're going through the mystery, the book tells you like, hey, you know, this thing happened at this place and kind of like a choose your own adventure, you decide if you want to go and, you know, you can go to Scotland Yard and talk to the detective there, or you can travel to these different points on the map. And like a choose your own adventure, you flip to that page in the book and see if anything relevant happens in that spot. Um, so it, fe it feels very immersive. Uh, the one adventure that I did, it was, a, it was a murder mystery. And, you know, you had a couple of common options like you can go talk to the coroner get an autopsy you can go you know talk to the detectives that were on the scene at the time you can go to the scene of the crime itself um and also uh, you can't quite see it that well in this uh, in this picture but you also get a newspaper for every every day that you've kind of been on the case oh. so like more information kind of gets revealed <laughs> through the news and it, it's actually kind of printed out on newspaper ish material so it feels like you're actually like holding a newspaper from that time so they did a lot to make it feel very immersive yeah, i love i love all those little notebooks on there oh yeah 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 there's like a phone directory and stuff um <laughs> this this game is so good uh and it's it's i, I think it's fun. Oh, it's a fun one player game. If you just love solving puzzles and kind of that murder mystery feeling. Uh, I liked doing this with a group of my friends. I had two or three uh, other people. We would sit down. And like I said, we would like eat some food, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe you know, get, get some drinks and just uh, read through, read through the books and somebody would get to narrate or they'd get to talk as the different characters if you wanted uh -oh. to, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Because there, yeah. there's di there's dialogue lines in the in the book, right? Okay. Because it's you talking to yeah. Oh, okay. The detective and That's stuff. That's interesting. So. All right. Yeah, the uh, fan fantastic set of games. Wow. Um, good for good for one or two <laughs> players for a nice chill evening. Yeah. For sure. I just love uh, I just love, love them. You should get up in fancy dress and then argue with each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Absolutely. Yep. So definitely could recommend. Um, <laughs> our our last one for the our one to two players is a game that's been very popular. Uh, it's called Seven Wonders Duel. This game's been around for a long time. Uh, people who are avid board game players out there would recognize Seven Wonders as <laughs> being one of those like quintessential, you need to have played this game to call yourself an avid board game player <laughs> uh, kind of game. But Seven Wonders uh -oh. Duel, <laughs> Seven <laughs> Wonders Duel is written by the, written by the same uh, people and they take a lot of similar elements to seven wonders and they condense it down into a two-player game um if you're not familiar with seven wonders as a, as a franchise uh, it basically um it's kind of like civilization yeah i've played a lot of civilization but never a, the board game neither the, neither the seven wonders nor the actual civilization board games y yeah well so it, it it kind of does it does a good job of feeling giving that 4x -y feel right where you um you you are kind of building this civilization and you know you can advance your civilization through uh military or you can go for like enlightenment like kind of digging through like science and stuff or you can go for like a culture 
victory. So it has that exact same feeling. Um, on the next slide, we'll look at some of the components of the game and, and the, the way that it looks. But uh, so what's being represented in our Seven Wonders duel is this pyramid here of cards. So the actual way that the game um, kind of plays out is you create this pyramid of cards, some cards you can see, some cards that you can't, and you choose things to build for your civilization. And building those things grant you certain benefits. So like, um, you know, building a barracks gives you more war points or like, you know, building uh, a water, uh, uh, like a water trough for, for horses to drink from or something would give you more like enlightenment victory. Um, you know, I'm not going to dig super deep into to the playing of this game. I can just tell you that it's wonderful. It's a two-player game. There are multiple ways to win. Uh, you get to build uh, wonders of the world. Um, there, you get to build seven. You get to build seven of them. So. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, it's again similar to Onitama. It's pretty fast to learn. It seems kind of overwhelming right here, but it, it's very quick. To learn the amount of choices that you make per uh kind of per turn is not super high so like you don't have to worry about it being really crunchy right like you basically you take your turn you take a thing you decide where you want to spend your points and then it's the next person's turn so it doesn't bog down very heavy and uh it's it's delightfully fun just because there's so many different ways uh there's there's so many different ways to win and, and things to go for. And because it's a two player game, you can also do a lot to block each other from winning in those avenues. Like it's a little bit easier in a two player game as opposed to a four player game, right? In a four player mm -hmm. game, everybody's winning in so many different ways. You really have to kind of pick and choose what yeah. you're going to do. <laughs> uh, but in this game, you're only playing against one other person. So you'd be like, oh, you're going for a military victory, huh? So you can like kind of <laughs> yeah. uh, do this. You don't, you don't get surprised by like the quiet person who's been building up their <laughs> building up their right. tanks and suddenly oh i win it's like oh, <laughs> oh. My, yeah. Space, yeah. My, my spaceship didn't even go up oh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. yeah so it's it's uh, it's it's a it's a great game um and that would be kind of one of the games that i'd like to i would wrap up our one to two player section with um oh, right it's really cool yeah all right, so our next section is going to be games for three to six players. Uh, this is by far the broadest group of games, right? Mm -hmm. um, the majority of games, I would say, are for two to four players that um, that kind of falls into this group. And then there's a couple of other games that expand beyond that to um, six-player games. But this would probably be the, the, the meat and potatoes of mm -hmm. board games in general fall, fall in this range. Uh, so there's a lot to choose from. Um, so I kind of being struck with decision paralysis, I decided <laughs> to kind of go with um, things that are already very popular. Um, so if you're watching this stream and you're like, hey, you know, I know about this game. I'm, you, it's totally cool. You know, like I'm glad that you do. I just want to make sure that the people who don't know about these games that are interested in going into board games would be able yeah. to check them out. So, um, so our first game and there's no way you can not <laughs> talk about this game, I feel like, on, on a board game stream, is Betrayals on the Hill. Uh, it's probably one of the first games that got me deep into board gaming, right? It's a lot of people's, um, what are they? Uh, it's a lot of people's uh, gateway game to mm -hmm. games. Um, Betrayal on the Hill is fantastic. And also, it is exactly three to six players, which, <laughs> which is pretty cool you can't play uh cannot be played with two people um because there is a betrayer mechanic type of thing it's a, it's a yeah. three-player game <laughs> to uh it's a six-player game and we can kind of see some of the um we see some of the components down here but um i do have a copy of the game but i think on the the i might have some things pointed out Ooh, additional betrayal games yeah so we can just talk about this real quick so uh betrayal has become such a, a popular mainstay game uh, for some time that they actually have a lot of additional games that are made for it um, <laughs> shown on this next slide. So we have Betrayal at Baldur's Gate, which is a fantasy setting um, that many gamers are familiar with. Yeah. Uh, actually, they're, com they're coming out with a video game, a uh, video oh. game re revamp for Baldur's Gate. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. So it's actually a, a very opportune time for, for yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and it's, the, since it's tie, that ties into like the whole look of 5th Ed Dungeons & Dragons, mm -hmm. it's a fun way to just be like, 
hey, do you want to play this but have more control over it? Why don't you play, <laughs> don't you play Fifth Ed? It's, you know, it's a, I do like the Baldur's Gate one a lot. But... Yeah, yeah, they use, they use Fifth Edition rules, which is perfect. <laughs> um, in the middle here, we got Betrayal Legacy, which is their... Um, uh, Legacy is a board game uh, signifier that tells us that the game has replayable elements where a previous playthrough of the game affects the next playthrough of the game. So yeah. in Betrayal Legacy, um, similar thing, and we'll be talking about the mechanics in just a minute, but in Betrayal Legacy, as you go through the story, your choices affect the next time that you play the game, which is which is really cool. Um, and then it, and then they have they made a Scooby Doo variant, which is the most recent <laughs> um, version of the game. But okay, I'm gonna switch my camera over here so we can kind of look at uh, the Betrayal game. This is also my personal copy, very very well loved, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, <laughs> I leave I leave edges there. Yes. Yeah, I leave my uh, personal copies at the shop to be played as a demo game. So oh, um, cool. yeah, that's why that's why they end up getting uh, beaten up a <laughs> bunch. But yeah, you know, we uh, started putting things in Ziploc bags and that kind of thing. But uh... <laughs> okay, so with Betrayal, and I, you know, I really think that I made another slide for this, but I'm not sure. Well, but we'll, we'll go ahead and take a look at some of the components while we're here. So with Betrayal at House on the Hill, we have... The, the main premise of the game is that you are playing uh, these characters in this bad B-rated horror film, right? You're like your car broke down outside and you decided to take refuge in this mysterious house. Uh, maybe you're trying to make a phone call. I don't know. I don't know why you would do this, but you, uh, you, walk, you walk into this house and the first stage of the game is exploring the house. So... Uh, similar things would be like a betrayal. You go into a dungeon, you're exploring the dungeon. So there's this, this mystery area that you don't know about. And by exploring the house, you have these uh, you have these space tiles. Um, so every the the cool thing about this is that every time you play this game, the play feels different because the house always takes a different shape. There's a random stack of tiles. And every time you explore a room, you flip over the next tile and then you place that into the room that you just walked into. And then the room tells you if something crazy happened. Like in this case, I walked into this house's gymnasium. Um, there's a little bird symbol here that tells me that I just triggered an omen. And it also tells me that if I end my movement here, I increase my speed because I, I guess I took the time to work out uh, while walking through the gymnasium of this creepy house that I, my car broke down in front of. So um, it's it's really cool. So first, already the, the replayability of this game is intense right like there's there's the house is different every time you play it um and then through one avenue or another whenever you explore enough of the house there is a possibility of the event an event triggering um, that event really dictates the scenario that you're going to be playing through and another thing that improves the replayability of this game so much is that the literally this base copy of the game has i think 50 scenarios in it uh, I've played this game probably hundreds of times. I've still not played all of the scenarios in this game because it's it's random which scenario you end up playing. And um, the reason why the game is called Betrayal is because more often than not, in this in this beginning part of the game, you start off moving around cooperatively, but then more often than not, the scenario will dictate that one of you, randomly selected, will be a betrayer, and that person now has an asymmetrical goal often opposed to the one that the rest of the party has. Uh, and that is delightful because you get to play the role of the betrayer or, or not. Um, so the game starts off being a cooperative game. And then by the end of it, it's usually like five people versus this one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the scenarios are these hilarious, like bad beat rated <laughs> horror movie plots you know, like what I think one of the scenarios I played, uh, you, the this random player to the right is is uh, has a becomes like a ghost bride, and their goal is to find the chapel in the house and get married. And you know, if they do that, then they win. The house, you know, sinks sinks into the ground, and everybody <laughs> dies. Uh, and your job is to try to like find the ancient wedding ring. Um, and you know, bring it to bring it to the altar and destroy it, and thus destroying the spirit and saving everybody. Uh, so that's that's the kind of thing 
the kind of scenarios that you play through. So it's, it's, it's got such a great narrative element, right? Because the scenarios are different every time. It yeah. starts off with cooperative play, but at any point in time, you know, one of you could become a betrayer. So you're like kind of working together. You're standing next to each other. And then you're like, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't stand too close yeah. <laughs> to each other because we're getting kind of close to this scenario thing happening. Um, it's just, it's just really immersive. And the kind of cards that you pick up too, or so there's like event cards that you can run into where like, so this one, an image, image in the mirror, you know, you walk mm -hmm. by a mirror and you, and you see yourself, but then you realize that 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 thing in the mirror is not you because it moves independently of you. And so you got like this kind of fun um, <laughs> horror movie tropes. Uh, you have like item cards you pick up, like you find like the sacrificial dagger, you know, and things, <laughs> things of that nature, right? So there's just like a lot of cool stuff and uh, homages to um, to horror movies. So if you're a big horror movie fan, yeah. then this game is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> In, in, in every way and like i said there's there's a ton of different variants of the game now too that all take place in the same similar structure um yeah like with the baldur's gate right so in baldur's gate you're a group of adventurers instead and you're you're diving through a dungeon and then usually something happens uh i think the one scenario i played we were going through we were going through the dungeon and somebody um uh, somebody somebody gets like attacked by a robot and the robot like takes them over and so you can't kill the robot because your buddy's inside so you oh. have to like you have to find a way to deactivate the robot <laughs> to uh to save save your guy um, wow that's cool and yeah, there was just creative ways of so it's not just oh go, go all five of you go kill that guy or it's yeah. like oh no you have to you have to activate you have to go into different corners of the house perform a ritual <laughs> yeah yeah, no, was, yeah they uh they they do they they find super i actually haven't played the scooby-doo one yet but i i <laughs> feel like that one probably has a lot of really goofy scenarios in it as well but yeah that's that's betrayal mm. oh, okay i did i did put a slide up here perfect okay <laughs> good all right um so <laughs> moving beyond betrayal is another classic that i'm sure most people have heard of it's called settlers of Catan. Um, you know, like my I I love Catan. I've played a lot of Catan. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's become it's become such a, a meme at this point that I, I think that <laughs> you know I, I don't I don't play it as often as I used to, but oh, um yeah. it's <laughs> for uh if, if you've never if you've never heard of Catan, you know, this is this is a great uh this is this is a good gateway board game as well because it, it introduces you to some euro game style concepts um that that makes up make up a big percentage okay. of board games and but what, what kind of what are some fact of the euro games like like character characteristics of them um so in a lot in a lot of your games i i think the big thing about your games is that you often don't know who's winning which is isn't technically true of Catan. so Catan, you are pretty apparent with the amount of points you have the first person to 10 points wins um so that doesn't share that much of a similarity to a euro game necessarily but a lot of the other elements like resource management um okay. you know you're you're spending you're spending resources to to build up into more resources um feels pretty pretty euro game-esque um okay okay so <clears throat> yeah so a seller the seller's good thing and the very basic premise is uh, you, you guys are new. Um, I, I guess you've discovered this new island and it's been named Catan and you're kind of uh, situated with trying to build it, right? You're trying to build your own civilization on Catan. Um, so this is what a, a sample map would look like. Now the actual resource tile, the tiles themselves on the left side are randomized every time. So our island of Catan will look different every time we play, so that helps improve the um, the replayability of the game. And you'll notice that there's some numbers on each of the tiles, and then uh, there are red and blue pieces kind of in between. Oh, there's some white pieces in there too, um, in between the tiles. So a brief explanation of what this means is so each each tile produces a specific resource and you can see those resources on the cards at the top right here so 
you can make clay or brick. Um, you have stone, you have sheep, you have wheat, um, and then you have wood, right on the on the far right. And I I can't see it because it's being hidden but hidden by my image. But <laughs> um, so and and that corresponds with the uh, Catan tiles that we see here and the numbers. So every turn, uh, every turn, the first thing that happens is the player, the active player is going to roll two dice. And the result that they roll, any settlements that are on that that are on those tiles get that resource, right? So, for instance, if you know it was my my turn to go, I roll the dice and I roll a six. Um, we look at the two tiles that have the sixes on them. They're pretty they're pretty clear. We have a stone tile in the top and the kind of the middle left, and we have a wood tile on the bottom right. So, if I roll the six, the white player would get a stone and a wood because he's bordering both of those tile spaces. Uh, the blue player would just get a wood and the red player would just get a stone, right? And so every turn we're generating resources by putting more settlements around different tiles, you can build more of a particular resource. And eventually you can spend resources to upgrade your settlements into cities and thus yielding twice as many resources when that number gets rolled. Um, and so the the, ba the very basic course of the game is pretty easy to understand, right? You're just building resources, and then there's there's a, usually a little help card that explains to you what you can spend those resources on. Um, normally, you need like a brick and a wood to build a road, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think what makes Catan so fun, and where you hear all of like the horror stories um, of Catan play, is that it um, it's kind of like Risk and Monopoly. And that kind, of, those kind of games, like like you you lose friends over them because the games, both in and of themselves, aren't designed to be combative, but they have combative mechanics, and so it kind of takes you by surprise, right? So in Catan, like one of the most devilish things is that you you trade you trade resources in Catan. It's actually a, a Catan is a three player game. It's actually not designed to play for two players because trading is supposed to be a main a main course of the game that helps you get the resources you need. But like it just it creates these scenarios of scarcity and kind of like robber baron style like, oh, I'm hoarding all the brick like, you know, you guys have no settlements on brick. I'm making all the brick. So if you want some brick, you're going to be paying me like, you know, hand over fist to get to get these brick. It's like it just has that kind of. Um, mm -hmm. Like I, I I don't know if the if the guy who designed Catan really expected for all of these arguments to be had, um, <laughs> but you just you just have these these classic like <laughs> scarcity issues because <laughs> you know it, yeah because everybody needs access to some of the resources to build and there's just no way that you're gonna have access to all of them starting out. Um, there's another thing too is that you'll notice that all right so uh, if you if you know 2d6 probability if you roll two six-sided dice the most likely outcome is going to be a seven because it's kind of in the middle between two and 12 which is our our biggest extremes uh, on the dice um there's actually no seven on the board so the the seven when you roll it there's a there's a black piece on the desert square um so when you roll a seven instead of anybody getting resources that round you move the robber bear into any space that's not the desert tile and it blocks that space from making any resources until another seven is rolled. So you have another opportunity to just be like, oh, okay, you, you, you think you're making all the brick? Well, now nobody's gonna get any brick because I rolled a seven <laughs> and I'm gonna put the robber bear in right I can't there. have it, no one can. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there's just, there's a lot of opportunity for stabbing each other in the back. And that's that's really where the, the funny Catan stories come from. Like on its surface, it looks like such a docile game. Like we're all just trying to make resources um, and build our settlements. Oh, there's also funny things you can do because of the building requirements. You can block people off by building a road where they're trying to go. You can literally just build a, build a road through, the, uh, through their settlement and now they can't build anywhere. So it's just like, there's just like so much stuff that you can do your, your village has been slated for demolition <laughs> yeah yeah so this is like it's there's a lot of fun combative stuff like that but then at the end of the day whoever gets to 10 victory points wins wins the game um so it yeah i think it's one of those games where on its surface it's easy to learn and it, it seems simple and probably not even interesting 
to a lot of people who, you know, wouldn't play board games or your games. But when you actually sit down and play it, you're like, oh, man, like I can really screw people over. And like people, people like that, you know, uh, it's a very enjoyable aspect. So anyway, if you haven't played Catan, def definitely play it. It's, uh, you know, I've played it so many times now that it, it's a, a special treat for me now whenever I do play it. But I promise you, usually the first time people play Catan, they're like, let's play that again. Like, I, I understand what I'm supposed to be doing now. Okay, let's give it another shot. Yeah, so definitely definitely would recommend. Um, all right, I think next up, we have we have one more game for this section. Um, I wanted to give a nod to maybe some more modern games. Uh, Azul is still a, an older game, I guess, at, at this point. Um, the original Azul, I think, came out in like 2014 or 15. Um, but... I just wanted to give a nod to Azul. It's, it's had several uh, expansions since then. This game was very popular. I believe it won the Spiel Award, which is this very prestigious board game award that happens in Germany mm. every year. Uh, I actually was going to go this year, but thanks, COVID. You know, uh, <laughs> not going to that anymore. But um, yeah, so Azul is a game about tile making. Uh, yeah, if you if you delve deeply into the world of board games, there is no mundane subject that hasn't been covered <laughs> by a board game somewhere. So we're making tiles, which again, doesn't necessarily sound that interesting, but it's really great for mul multiple different reasons. One, the game is gorgeous because you're building these beautiful tile mosaics. And um, two, uh, you know, there's just something relaxing and some and simplistic about a, this kind of process, I guess. But uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what's involved here. So uh, on the left, we'll, you'll see a sample of um, Azul tiles. So these are the tiles you're going to be using to make your uh, you make your tile floor. I think um, one of the expansions you're making a wall instead. But you know, <clears throat> so this is our tile floor. Uh, on the right, you see a, a personal board that you would have as a player. So everybody would have one of these boards on the right. So the pieces on the left would be considered uh, different factories that you're petitioning for particular uh, colors of tiles. And then the right is your own your own uh, build out. So um, again, not going to dig deeply into the mechanics of Azul, but uh, in general, you are drafting for for tile pieces. And once you do, you place those tiles on the, um, you kind of see how you, you see there's that grid and then there's the um, the, the kind of pyramid next to it, the, this um, with the arrows pointing to the grid. See that there? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, once you fill up one of those lines, you get to fill that space out on your overall grid. So your overall rec, uh, square grid is what you're trying to fill out in the long run. And if you're able to fill out the whole thing, then you probably just win because it's really difficult to do. But <laughs> you're trying to fill that out. And in order to fill that out, you have to fill the the production lines next to it all the way up. And then you can and then you can move a tile over and, and fill it out. It's very simple. It, I, I'm probably explaining in a way that makes it sound more complicated than it really is. You're just picking up tiles from the pieces from the places on the left and then just putting them on your board on the right. That's really, that's really all there is to it. <laughs> but, um, there's interesting choice involved because by picking up certain tiles, you deny them from other players. Uh, if you overfill your production line, there's some penalties uh, that are incurred. But I think uh, for a lot of times when I describe board games, I want to try to keep it simple because ultimately the game isn't hard to learn. Like when I sat down and learned how to play Azul, like they explained the rules to me in five to 10 minutes and then we just sat down and played. And it's it's one of those games where if you just play through it, it makes sense. It makes way more sense than trying to listen to a detailed explanation of it and then, and then going through with it. Uh, but it, it's... Once again, a beautiful game. Whenever, whenever you buy it, like you get all these tiles and you fill out your, you fill out your factory floor, and you, um, you're kind of pulling the tiles. Like it just is really pretty. And like I said, this game, this game's won a ton of awards and uh, also has several expansions out for it at this point in time. So it must be, it must be doing something right. You know, <laughs> like they're, uh, they're doing something really good. And this, it's, it's really, it's been a very popular game for like my board game nights and stuff mm -hmm. whenever I have them. 
uh so yeah i wanted to throw a shout out to azul uh i mean i could just <laughs> rattle off a bunch of other games in, in this category but i you know we can only cover so much with the amount of time that we have like i really wanted to cover wingspan that's been a very popular game it's about bo- it's about birds it's about bird watching oh. um, yeah like i said names name any mundane activity and there's probably a, there's probably a board <laughs> game about it um so but wingspan has been hugely popular it is about is about bird watching and oh. what i like about euro games or uh, this board games now uh, and you know we'll move on to the next slide in just a minute. But uh, what what I really love about board games now is that there's been this push for there to be um, this educational process. So um, like one of my one of my favorite board game designers, uh, Uwe Rosenberg, he uh, grew up in Eastern Europe, and he's made all of these board games uh, about very normal things. <laughs> <laughs> And they're very fun, but in in the course of these board games, he has an entirely separate book in the box that teaches you about the history of what you're looking at. Um, for instance, one of one of my favorite games that he designed was a, a Feast for Odin. is a very complex. Uh, I was thinking about covering that in my complex section on on Tuesday, but it's a, it's a complex Euro game, and you uh, you be- you essentially play these Vikings, and you are collecting you're collecting food, and you're trying to uh, explore other territories. But uh, there's this whole separate booklet where you can learn about all of the stuff that you're that you're doing. And he's he's this very avid history fan. He loves the region of the world that he's from and like the agriculture involved. He has a lot of agriculture based games, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> um, do, and, oh, sorry. Did he do Carcassonne or? Uh, no, I don't think so. Carcassonne uh, Z-Man games. I think that's a, that's a separate thing. Okay. Um, also, also a fantastic game. Could have could have gone very easily in my three to six uh, <laughs> player board game section. Great game, uh, but yeah. So like with um, with Wingspan, you know, there's like some facts about birds on there, and like there's like you just it's it's fun to kind of like learn about the history of stuff as you're playing as you're playing through games. Um, I think that's a very beautiful way to try to educate people about your culture, um, and 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 things. So, but all right. Enough, enough digressing about uh, about learning <laughs> while playing games. We'll uh, we'll move on to our last section here, and it looks like we're doing really doing well on time. Okay, so our last section is for seven plus players. Uh, this might be the category of games that I get asked about the most hmm. when people are coming in. Uh, I find that when people physically walk into a game store not knowing what they're looking for. It's because they need something that night because <laughs> they're <laughs> like, oh, man, you know, I'm going to a party and I, I just need like some icebreaker game or my company is doing a, you know, meet and greet and we want to play a thing. What game do you have that plays the most, most like a huge group of people? Um, and so we are introduced to the world, the wide world of party games, uh, games designed to play with a ton of different people. The nice thing about these games is that they're very quick to learn and they're often very active and engaging because they're meant to be played at a party. Usually if you uh, if you play like a very intense game at a party with a bunch of people, people start <laughs> losing interest, they don't pay attention. So party games try to keep people active. So our first game on the list, one of my favorites is Wavelength. Um, yeah so this game came out pretty recently i think it came out uh 2019 came out last year and uh it takes an interesting new spin on a it's like it's like a judge game and a word game kind of mashed together so what i mean by judge game is that uh there's several games where one person plays a judge and other people kind of appeal to that person so examples would be like apples to apples um cards against humanity uh, things like that where like one person plays this judge and another person is um and the rest of the people are trying to appeal to that person to kind of pick their thing so in wavelength our uh we we have our, we have a judge person who is going to uh give I, I think in this case the judge is more their team and the person who is who has the wavelength uh apparatus gives a clue so um let me rewind a bit. We'll talk about what the game is about in general. So <laughs> as, as a word game uh, in wavelength, what you're trying to do is you're trying to be on the same wavelength as your 
team. And uh, they came up with a clever way to establish that connectivity via this game. So uh, I actually have a copy here so we can take a look at it. And I'll switch my camera over as well. This should be good. Yeah. Um, so first off, we have a pretty box. So in Wavelength, we actually have uh, this apparatus. And I'll come, I'll come in and explain this in just a minute. But in general, in Wavelength, what, what they do is they, they create, they have a bunch of cards that creates a scale. And you are attempting to give a clue to your team to help determine where on that scale this uh, where on that scale this this particular marker falls. So first the apparatus. Here we have a window that opens and closes, and we have this uh, this kind of red thing that moves around on front of the window. And then we have the back of the thing in general that moves this uh, this thing around. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Yeah. So the first thing you do is you randomize where you that marker is, and then the person who's going to be giving the clue and only that person gets to look to see where the marker is. So in this case, we can see that the marker is much farther on the left. The center of the marker, especially, is farther on the left than it is anywhere else on the thing. Then we can cover it up. And then the next thing is the person is given a scale. So I'm going to draw a card at random here. So this scale says um, from, <laughs> what does it say? Underrated letter of the alphabet to overrated letter of the alphabet. So this is, this is our scale. So my job now as a clue giver is to try to get my team to pick to, to move to move this marker to be on where the line is. Yeah. But they can't see it. So I get to give them a clue. So mm -hmm. in this case, my clue would be related to a very underrated letter of the alphabet, right? So this Okay. We, we dig into a lot of personal opinions here. Um, <laughs> so maybe I would my clue would be and my clue would be obviously very underrated. So yeah. I think a very underrated letter of the alphabet is Y. You know, there's not a lot of names that start with Y. It's an often forgotten about letter, but it's very important. It's sometimes a vowel, right? It's our well, sixth. It's a double agent. You can't trust it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a secret vowel. So maybe I would give the clue <laughs> Y and my team would be like, okay, the letter Y. Well, do I think that that's an overrated letter, underrated letter? And they'd be like, okay, I think that it's an underrated letter, but, you know, maybe it's like this underrated. You know, okay. and they would they would they would kind of set the marker where they think it's gonna be, and then we would reveal ba, 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 because they put it on the two. They got our team gets two points. Okay. So if they got closer, you know, they would get three points or four points depending on where they ended up putting the marker. Um, hmm, and that's yeah, it's a super it's it's a super cool game, and um, you can play <laughs> with any number of people really. It's a team game, so. However many people are at your party, you split that number of people in half and you just go for it. And uh, hilarity ensues. Um, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the option on the opposite side of the card was optional or mandatory. They have some advanced cards here, like uh, on a scale of little known facts to well-known facts and stuff like that. So like you get some, you get some really interesting um, scales to work with. <laughs> This one says never on time to always on time. So you get to talk about some coworkers probably, you know, like uh <laughs> oh, fellas, come on. <laughs> um the game just has uh so much replayability. It's quick to learn. Um it's one of those games where just jumping into it and playing it goes a lot faster than having to explain the minute details of the game and uh it just ends up being hilarious because a lot of the scales that they have are are things that you've never thought about, and then you have to try to relate to your 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 team, you know, in in a in such a odd way, right? Like you might be like, okay, well, 
I don't know how well my team knows me, but like maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe they think that the letter Y, maybe they think that I think that the letter Y is a very overrated letter. Like, oh, they talk about Y all the time, you know, like why is the sixth vowel? Ooh, you know, like they, um, so there's just a lot of opportunity for, for arguments to occur, which is what's fun about a lot of party games, in my opinion. Uh, so, but yeah, so that's a, uh, uh, wavelength has been so great and has has been just a barrel of laughs the the entire time that i've played it um i would fall i would put wavelength in the category of word games so i think on this uh you'll recognize this slide i actually posted this on tuesday as well these are other great word games that you can play that also feature a large number of people mm -hmm. and they're like most word games they're team-based games so you know you can play with any number of people divide it by two split them up into teams yeah. and play um i've played all of these games i <laughs> love them all wavelength is just the most recent one and so i've i've been busting that one out at board game night a lot and and playing it and we've been having a ball yeah. uh, would recommend yeah i was, I was especially uh, listening to the the tuesday one as trap where it sounded like a lot of fun yeah yeah like reverse taboo reverse, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh also, it's, also like that cutesy dungeon crawler style on the box there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no it's uh trap words is fun because it's a lot of like i think that you think that i think that this is the thing <laughs> like you like you get through so many different levels of you know because they can write like they can write very simple words or they can go like really out there so you're like really trying to second guess you know how how much how much they're really trying to trap you so mm -hmm. <laughs> so definitely definitely a good game um all right Next up on the list, I think we have Jalapagos. Um, this is also another game that I've demoed a good bit at my board game nights. Uh, well, Jalapagos is a fantastic example of a cooperative game. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like Betrayal, where um, you're you're supposed to be cooperative the entire. Like the concept is, you know, we're we're stranded on an island. We have to work together to get off of the island. Mm -hmm. And so the expectation is for us to all work together, but it doesn't always pan out that way. <laughs> and there's plenty of ways for us to stab each other in the back. Uh, <laughs> so let's look at, let's look at some of this gameplay here. In Jalapagos, we have this nice little board. The, um, we have a shipwreck um, on the right side here. Everybody has a hand of shipwreck cards. And um, we have some raft cards and some other things. So uh, what I like about demoing Jalapagos is that it goes very fast. The game doesn't really bog down that much because everybody can only do one thing on their turn. They literally pick from a list of four options, and those are the things that you do. You can either fish for more food, find more water, search the shipwreck for more shipwreck cards, or start building a raft. Okay, those are your only four options throughout the entire game. And the win condition, the players who, all right, so if you have enough rafts for everybody that's still alive, and you have twice, <laughs> it's, it's very important. If you have enough rafts for everybody who's still alive, and you, uh, and you have twice as much food and water, because you have to have food and water for the trip when you leave, as everybody who's still alive, then everybody who is still alive wins. That's the game, right? Mm -hmm. um, you very quickly learn that sometimes it's easier to have one less mouth to feed uh, <laughs> than it is to try to save everybody who's there. Uh, and the game, the game makes that happen really well. Um, so you start off with a certain amount of food and water, and every day that passes you have to consume an amount of food and water that is equal to the number of players that are still alive. And if you do not have enough for each missing item of food and water, you have to vote for a player to die because they just don't get fed or don't get water that day. Uh, so it gets backstabby real quick and you kind of divide into fat. Like I, I haven't played a game that really uh, feels realistic around the politics that might involve surviving on an island with a group of your friends this game is it right because you're like well there's just not enough food and water for everybody you know like somebody's gotta go 
who has been the most useless this entire time? <laughs> you know, like you're you're out here pointing fingers. So like, John, every your time, rap looks like matchsticks. Get out right? of here. <laughs> yeah, right. Every time you've gone fishing, you've only brought back one fish. You know, like that's not it. <laughs> like it's 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 a hoot. Um, what uh, what dictates the amount of water you get is there's a deck that that you flip over a card every day, and that's how much it's rained. So there are also like drought days where you can get zero water. So you kind of have to like, you have to worry about overstaving on water because you might run into those drought days. And then at the end, in case you guys just spend a lot of time dawdling, the way that the game forcibly ends is that uh, towards the end, the, the, there's, a, uh, there's a hurricane day. And on the hurricane day, you have to try to leave. And by have to try to leave, it means uh, you kill off as many people as necessary so that, you know, like by hurricane day, if you only have two rafts and four food and water, only two of you are getting off, no matter how many people survived at the hurricane day. Um, it's, it's so cool. And so uh, the last thing I want to say about Jalapagos is what really makes the game go well, besides the, the uh, conversing about, you know, not feeding people is the shipwreck cards is a, um, it's a bundle of cards that you only you know about, and you can use them cooperatively to help the party, but you can also hold them to yourself selfishly. And so they they create the the final and like more depth element of the game because like all right if you if your ship rare cards you can have like a can of sardines and that feeds a person, you can toss that in and be like, hey guys, as a group, we all have an extra food. Or you can hold on to it. And if <laughs> at one point the party is like, hey, we don't have enough food, John, you're out. Well, you'd be like, oh, well, I actually have enough food to feed myself for today because of the card in my <laughs> hand. So like, there's almost like this incentive to be selfish because you can save yourself if it, if it came down to it, you know? Like, because... <laughs> If we're out of food and I have enough to feed myself in my hand, but you know Mary doesn't, and they vote Mary off, well then that's one less mouth to feed, and I still got this food in my hand to protect me the next time a vote comes around. You know, so like there's <laughs> there's this whole feeling too. Um, and then there's there's like special items and stuff. Like there's a this caffeine pills, so you get like two actions in the day. Um, the morbidly there is a there's a, a cannibal barbecue kit. Where you make you make two food per player that's died. That's a presumably oh. yeah. <laughs> it's like stuff like that. And uh, the the thing that it often comes down to is that uh, there you can you can find a gun and you can find bullets, and so you can just shoot other players <laughs> that are just like, oh okay, oh we're arguing right now. All right, well you're just dead. <laughs> like, like, like all right, <laughs> death match. All right, fine. Yeah. Um. And what's funny is they can vote. They can vote you off. Because there's not enough food, and then you can just shoot John and just be like, "Well, now there's enough food for everybody," you know, because <laughs> you're just gonna eat John's food. Um, so so the, the game, the game is hilarious, and like I said, it's it's very fast. Like uh, you, I've just had people sit sit down and just be like, "Look, we're just gonna start playing. I'm not even gonna explain to you how to play. Like we're just gonna start playing. We're just gonna go around, and uh, and it it it, it goes really fast." Um, I love throwing. Uh, when I'm demoing the game, I love throwing a friend group that knows each other really well into this game because like the party <laughs> dynamics come out very fast right like you can tell what kind of friend group this is because they immediately react uh to to the situation at hand great game plays up to 10 people i think so it's just like a uh you can um yeah you can host a lot of people with this game and it's very minimalist it comes in a tiny little box uh it's like 20 bucks for the game it's not it's not very expensive so uh definitely has been a top seller i don't think that i have failed to sell a copy of this game after i've demoed it to a group of people so it's um that great great pick all right i think we got time for one more before we're running out here last up we're going to talk about um uh, the barbecue yeah right uh, we're going to talk about uh social deduction games is a very common category for party games the one i chose was donner dinner party um i don't <laughs> it is also a little bit morbid uh, not everybody might be familiar with the donner dinner uh the donner party but you know well uh, we'll move past it here <laughs> so um in the donner dinner party 
you know, you're also trying to survive. You get stranded in the snowstorm. Um, usually in social deduction games, the goal of the game is that you know for a fact that amongst you, there are betrayers. And if the the overall course of the game is if the good guys can determine who the betrayers are, the good guys win. And the bad guys just need to, you know, schmooze and um, overall sabotage things, and then the bad guys will win. So in the daughter dinner party, there are people in the group who are cannibals. And they want to eat other people. Uh, and and uh, the good guys, the non-cannibals win if you survive the number of days it takes for you to be rescued um the bad guys win if the bad guys eat enough people so that there's an equal number of bad guys to good guys uh is really what it is uh what i like about donner dinner party as a social deduction game is that there is a, an impetus for the game to move forward so with a lot of social deduction games i don't know if you've ever played you know mafia or werewolf or um secret hitler and stuff like that there's a lot of just arguing uh and the game doesn't really progress forward unless you like push it to progress forward in the donner dinner party there's a mechanism that just does that for you essentially every day everybody goes out hunting so there uh, as you can see in the diagram here there's hunting cards um and you're you're sent you're given three hunting cards and as a part of those you pick which hunting card you want to contribute to the party and that determines whether or not somebody would die that day. So if there's enough food in the hunting party and the hunting cards to feed everyone, then nobody dies that day. We move to the next day. Everything's good. If there isn't enough food, then somebody has to die. You vote, you vote out who dies and you, the party presumably eats that person because they didn't have enough food. Um, what's interesting about this is one, the hunting cards are random. So you might be a good guy, but you might not get any good cards. You might get all bad cards. And so you're forced to put in a bad card anyways and then have to defend your position as a good guy. Um, of course, the hunting cards are shuffled randomly in there. So nobody knows who actually threw in things. And the leader doesn't get hunting cards. They take a random hunting card from the top and put it into the pile. So there's always a, there, there's always a random element that you might just be like, oh, well, that might just be the random card. You know, um, The hunting cards include nothing one fish, two fish, or like two squirrels or something, two food units. Um, and there's also poison and poison remedy. So if somebody puts in a poison, all the food is poisoned. Guys, I found and, this poison. <laughs> I found this poison, guys. You know, she's gonna, gonna do the thing. Um, and so that makes it very interesting because you can look at the hunting cards that have been put in and just be like, well, two people put in poison. So that precludes the fact that one of the poisons could be random somebody else intentionally put in poison and somebody might be like well i just drew three poison cards so i really didn't have a choice i had to put something in you know like there's there's this whole um discussion and then there are also items that come with it um so everybody has like a signature item as you can see in the bottom right here you might have come with snowshoes so you get to pick two hunting cards you're twice twice as effective as hunting or you have a knife or one of them i think is like a shotgun you can just kills like if they vote to kill you you can take somebody out with you as, as you go down yeah <laughs> um and, and stuff like that so it's it's a great uh i like it i think it's a good twist on the social deduction game um and this one was also pretty recent they came out in 2018 so it's a it, it's pretty good i think on the next slide i put some other social deduction games uh that people have heard about the resistance is a classic social deduction game um I think the resistance is good because it takes it at its most basic. Like you just are, you're either good guys or you're spies and the good guys are trying to root out the spies in their organization. Um, I think almost everybody has at least heard of werewolf mm -hmm. at this point in time. Like, even if you haven't played it, you've probably heard of werewolf. Um, great, great social deduction game. Uh, I wanted to do a brief shout out to blood on the clock tower as well blood on the clock tower is not out yet they're currently still in the testing phase it's supposed to come out either christmas this year or early next year and it's a what what they kind of call is like a fixed they they've made improvements on the social deduction structure and uh have 
compiled all of the improvements into into the same kind of game um so it's supposed to be like a better werewolf is is what they're is what they're recommending if you haven't played a social uh, social deduction games aren't for everybody uh some people are really bad at lying um <laughs> i always know because whenever i play with those people i'm like are you a bad guy and they're like no you know like they they're just <laughs> not very good at masking um so it's not always for everybody but uh if you're the kind of person who kind of likes sleuthing and figuring out who somebody is at the same time you like being a saboteur type thing it is a very unique style of game um and some people love it and they could just play social deduction games forever and other people hate it and they never want to play it um (laughs) i i know that regardless of which camp that you're in social deduction games are always a great time to watch Uh, it's really fun to watch people play them because it's just ridiculous the kind of excuses people make up and the the weird logical loopholes they create for themselves to try to either enforce a lie or to root out a lie um (laughs) it's always a good time but i think that's all the time we have today yeah that's yeah indeed that yep oh there's our there it is (laughs) there is the place yeah it's my my cheese my cheesy uh ad here (laughs) make it make it a game night come to little wars uh we What's that? What's that? The good. What, what's that shopping center that it's in? It was, uh, it's the name. Yeah, it's not. It's the Jefferson Jefferson Plaza. Jefferson Plaza. Yeah, because I know it's like uh, Jefferson Plaza. It's right next to. It's right next to Whole Foods. If you guys know where Whole Foods is in the yeah. town town center, um, it's it's across the street, um, from Whole Foods, right right in the same shopping center as Goodwood Hardware and uh, Cafe Americana. Uh, we're a little little board game store. We've been uh, the first iteration of Little Wars opened in 1987, so it is uh, older than I am. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we just like to hang out and have a good time and play games. So if you guys ever have any questions whatsoever, you're always feel free to ask me. I'm there all the time. You can give <laughs> us a call or send us a message, and we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Our entire board game catalog is also online at littlewars.com so if you want to order a game you can come pick it up and we'll bring it out to your car or we can just ship it to you slash drop it off at your house mm-hmm. um for for a small delivery fee so anyway yes. thank you so much for having me yeah thank you again Van, for coming and i know my, my christmas list has now grown exponentially <laughs> <laughs> it's just the helopagus oh my god that's <laughs> oh yeah no <laughs> just whew. But anyway, and so if you out there have a gamer in your life, you're going to think, what do I do for them? Well, well, now you know where to start. You can look at any of these, you know, ask for any of these games or ask the staff at Little Wars for other recommendations. They're always very helpful. And if there's something that you've heard about, but don't, they don't have, they'll order it for you. It'll, it'll zip right to you. So they'll zip it right to you. They'll get it right, ready for you. So mm-hmm. thank you, Ken Van. Absolutely. And, as Van mentioned, library uh, in terms of library resources for games, we do have a few gaming books. We have some of the, the path, uh, some some core rule books for Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder, so you could read them if you wanted to. We have a lot of books on chess too, so you can always yeah. learn about chess. But I mean, one of the main things, obviously, about a library is just being around books and looking at art and looking at like like a lot of the games. We some of those good games have really distinct art styles and you know based on the sort of you know you know like there's sort of beautiful cultural art there's I mean there's tons of games that are just about like making an artwork you know things like that so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. come to the library and just pick pick an armload of, of pick an armload of novels pick up a whole bunch you know it's good yeah That's, absolutely you know, eventually we'll get back to in-person gaming uh, last year for International Games Week, we did have some you know, game demonstrations. I ran a D and D module. It was a lot of fun, and I hope, to do, that. I hope to do that next year. And with any luck, maybe if you know if things start to get Im- improved, then you could do it way more often because it was it was a lot of fun. Just yeah. finding a module on a drive-through RPG and or and just and just bashing through it with like whoever shows up. Like here, come on, <laughs> take this dwarf figure and come on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Time to go. <laughs> if you enjoyed this program please check out more of our videos on facebook and our youtube channel ebrpl those ebrp library tv oh i've got a slide there we go Ooh. oh yeah okay. yes oh, there it is 
Yes, you can enjoy more programs like this one. We're doing a lot of virtual, obviously. I think they're going pretty well. They're pretty neat. Mm -hmm. It's pretty fun to, you know. Take I've, had, I've had a great time participating. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> I've had a great time. I've, this, is, this is fantastic. I could, <laughs> this, I could do this all day, forever, forever and ever. All right. Well, okay. Yeah, I think we're good.